Would you join me in prayer, please? Holy God, you are a God of love, a God of power, a God of grace, a God of majesty. May your spirit come in power upon your people so that we will be changed and transformed, so that the, at the end of our time together, we will know that we are new and different people because you are at work in our lives to do wonderful and amazing things. Amen. Is Jesus here? Yes. yes How is he here? In what way is he here? Spirit. He's here in spirit. Is that all? In our hearts, in us. Jesus is here bodily, physically. He is not gone. He is alive and present in the world today. During this season of Lent, I'm going to talk about four different ways, and four different Sundays, the way in which Christ, the body of Christ, is present here with us. Now, one of the ways that he's present is in the sacrament, because whenever you come up and have the bread, what do I say to you? This is what? Body. This is the body of Christ. Now, if your pastor's head was screwed on right, we would talk about that on the Sunday we're sharing communion, but we'll do that another time. <laughs> now, today, I'm going to talk about you. I'm going to talk about your body. Christ dwells in your body. Let's talk about our bodies for a second. You do not have a body. You are a body. Your body is an integral part of who you are, of what makes you who you are. One time someone asked Jesus, what's the most important law? And he said, love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength. We're pretty good at the first three, loving God with our heart, soul, and mind. Because that's what we think, that's who we are. And these bodies, our body isn't really me. This is just sort of what my, my spirit drives around in order to get through the world. But that's not true. Your body is exactly who you are. There is a heresy, a misunderstanding of Christianity back in the early days called Gnosticism. And the Gnostics thought the spirit is good and the body is bad. And Jesus came to liberate us from the worldly, the physical, the corporeal, because that's all nasty, horrible stuff. That was the error that the Gnostics taught. Now, we see a little trace of this in Paul's writings. And sometimes the Apostle Paul uses a word, sarx. That's a Greek word that literally means flesh, like, you know, flesh and bone, even flesh that you eat. But the way he uses it, he's also referring to our sinful nature. As if our flesh, our sinful nature, that's what we need to be saved from. In one sense, that's true, because our bodies do carry our passions and sinful desires. But our mind, I don't know about you, but our minds can come up with plenty of ways to sin on their own without our body. Would you agree? Yes. Let me just give you one example. We can become so transfixed in ideologies or political viewpoints that they become so important to us that they become our idols. They become more important to us than following God himself. That's just one example. So our bodies are not the only part of us that leads us to sin. We're pretty good at doing it no matter what. Part of why we deny that our body is part of us, or we like to think our body isn't part of us, is what they call body shaming. Have you ever heard of that word? Body shaming... Um, well, a friend of mine once said, we all have a body story. What she meant by that is, we all have something in our past that makes us ashamed of our bodies. Can you think of a time when something happened or someone said something to make you ashamed of your body? You're too fat. You're too short. You're too tall. You're too skinny. Look how you're physically limited, things you can't do. Or as you get older, look at how your hair's falling out or turning gray. Look at those wrinkles you've got. Look how old you're getting. Look at all those disabilities or infirmities you have that prevent you from doing what you want or from doing what you used to be able to do. One of my body shaming stories is I have really skinny arms. <laughs> I knew that the whole time. And 
couple of years ago, even up at the farm show, you know where they have the clown over uh, the water bucket and it's insulting people going by? Even the clown was telling me I shouldn't be wearing a muscle shirt because I don't have any muscles. <laughs> That's one of my body shaming stories. You have one too, I'll bet, right? And so we carry these messages with us and we think there's something wrong or bad about our bodies. We don't measure up the, to the Ken and Barbie doll ideal that we think we should have. Even glamorous supermodels, or maybe I should say especially glamorous <laughs> supermodels, suffer from thinking that our bodies are not what they should be. That's why cosmetic surgery and diet fads and workout routines are so popular. Often, not always, but often, we engage in these things because we're dissatisfied with our bodies. We believe the messages that our bodies are bad or, or just, no, who would want it? In the midst of a world that tells us our bodies are bad, that our bodies aren't good enough, in the midst of thinking that maybe our body isn't even part of who we are, then, then we hear God's message. We hear it from the very beginning of the Bible, one of the very first things God told us. He said that we were created how? You know what he said? We're created in his image. Not just talking about, oh yeah, our spirits have the image of God. No, our bodies are created in God's image. Each of our bodies is a unique reflection of the divine. And in case we miss it, just a couple of verses later, Genesis tells us God saw all that he made, including us, and he said it was very good. Now what's really cool is on the first days of creation, at the end of the day, he looks at it and says it's good. But it's after he created humanity, then he said, it's very good. <laughs> now, some of you more theologically sophisticated people might say, oh, well, that's in Genesis 1. That's before Adam and Eve ate the apple, but it was a fruit, not an apple, and sin came into the world, and everything got messed up, and now we're just all these sinful people, and, and so we, we've lost the image of God, and, and God isn't happy with our bodies anymore. You could say that. Until you read Psalm 139, what we all read together. And the psalmist said, you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. God, you made my body, in other words. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. God looks at your body and says, it is wonderful. Okay, now my point for the sermon today is not just that your body is part of what makes you who you are, and it's not only that God finds delight in your body just as it is right now. That's true, but I want to go one step farther. God desires for his spirit to dwell in you, to dwell in your body. I think he read for us from 1 Corinthians chapter 6, where Paul is addressing the issue of sexual immorality, specifically prostitution. He says, the body was not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. Let's pause there for just a moment. Your body is meant for the Lord. Not just your soul, not just your spirit. Your body is meant for the Lord. Now, literally in the Greek, what it says, the body to the Lord and the Lord to the body. And Paul sets up a parallel to something else in the same passage. He says, the stomach for food and food for the stomach. In other words, the reason we have stomachs is what? <laughs> to eat food. And the reason we have food is why? To put it in our stomach. In the same way, the reason we have a body is for the Lord to inhabit it. And the reason the Lord comes to us is to inhabit our bodies. And to make sure we don't miss the point, Paul goes on in verse 15. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? Not your spirit, not your soul, not your heart. Your body is a member of Christ himself. Look at your body. No, no, no look at me. Don't look at my body. Look at your body. <laughs> Um, look at or maybe picture in your mind, if you dare, the part of your body that you're most ashamed of. Go on, do it. 
Why are you still looking at me? <laughs> Think of what you look like in a mirror. Think of the flaws that you see that are so painfully evident to you. This body of yours is a member of Christ. It is part of Christ himself. Okay, you can open your eyes now. He didn't say your spirit is part of Christ's spirit. That could be a topic for another sermon. But that your body is a part of Christ himself. So if we want to say, is Christ physically present? Yes, here in our bodies. Christ is physically present here with us. If you want to see the body of Christ, look at your own body. Because it is a part of, it is a reflection of the body of Christ. Now, in this particular passage, Paul was focusing on how Corinthians misused their bodies sexually. Because apparently, in the, the church in Corinth was really screwed up <laughs> in a bunch of different ways. But apparently, some people in the church thought it was okay to visit prostitutes or maybe even be prostitutes themselves. And sexual immorality definitely is still part of our society's woes today. I can attest to that. Well, I was on vacation. I went to New Orleans for Mardi Gras. You could see it all over the place there. But body shaming is at least as bad as sexual immorality because it is so pervasive. And it strikes at the very sense of our very selves. What Paul had to say about prostitution applies to the way that we are ashamed of our bodies also. And Paul asked, do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you? Your body is a temple of the Spirit. Now those people in Corinth, they knew all about temples. Because ancient Corinth had plenty of them. They had three temples for Aphrodite, the goddess of love, alone. They also had temples for Apollo, Hera, Poseidon, Alcipius, Hermes, Athena, Zeus, and Jupiter. They knew what a temple was because they were all over the place. A temple is a place where a god dwells or lives. A temple is a physical location in this world for where you can encounter that god. The pagan Corinthians would go to these temples to be in the presence of that god. And then Paul says, your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. You don't have to travel somewhere to be in God's presence because God's presence is where? In you. In Luke chapter 11, uh, Jesus has this short little teaching where he says, if an evil spirit is cast out of you uh, and your heart or your soul remains empty, someone else is going to come in. It could be even worse if you don't invite God in. In other words, your body will be inhabited by, your body will be a temple of some spirit one way or the other. Could be an evil spirit. You know, those spirits that imprison us with addiction or hatred or failure to forgive or shame or trauma or passions. Christ wants to remove these spirits from our lives. He can and he will. But it is not enough for the landlord to kick a bad tenant out of the house. What happens if... Imagine you're a landlord. I don't know if any of you are or not. Imagine you're a landlord and you have a bad tenant. They're just messing up the house. So you kick them out and now your house is empty. Is that a good thing to leave the house empty? Why not? Why is that a bad thing? What's that? People will burglarize it. Out in the country, the raccoons will move in. In the city, the squatters will move in. Might even turn into a crack house. So no, you don't want to leave your... This, you don't want to leave your temple, your body, empty either. A wise landlord invites good tenants to move into the house. So when Christ is at work in your life to free you from whatever evil spirit it is that you have, that's only the first step. The next step is to invite the Lord to move in. To let him take up residence in the temple of your body. Paul ended by saying, therefore, Honor God with your bodies. In other words, live in your body in such a way that you are honoring the presence of God that is in your body. To disparage your own body is to disparage the spirit of God who dwells in it. If you were to say, oh, my body's all broken down, it's miserable, it's lousy. 
you're not just you're not offending yourself you are offending the God who lives in this body that you're talking about so care for your body treat it not only as God's precious gift but treat your body as a vessel as a container of God yes you live in your body but your body is also how Christ is present in the world honor God with your body not only how you use it but how you view your body your body is honorable your body is precious your body is blessed when Paul said honor God with your body honor can mean to adore to worship to glorify to recognize the dignity of the excellence of the majesty of just as those ancient pagan Corinthians could go to one of their temples to meet one of their gods other people can encounter you and in the midst of encountering you they can recognize the presence of God in you have you ever had that experience you meet someone it could be a stranger you meet for the very first time and you see them and you can instantly tell I feel God in them have you had that experience I hope so and I hope other people have had that experience with you when they are with you they can say oh, Maybe they don't say it out loud. Maybe they don't, even, they don't have words to put into it, but somehow they recognize God's here. You are a walking, living, breathing temple of God. You are carrying Christ's presence with you everywhere you go. So what does it take to be a body that has Christ living in it? What does it take for you to be a temple of God? It's not what you might think. You don't have to make your body, you don't have to make yourself good enough for Christ's spirit to live in you. Because guess what? You already are. Remember what I said in Genesis 1? You are very good. You're made in God's image. Remember Psalm 139? You are fearfully and wonderfully made. What does it take for you to have Christ's spirit live in you so that you are a living, breathing member of the body of Christ? All it takes is simply to invite him. In fact, you don't even have to invite him because he's already at the door dying to come in. All you have to do is accept him and receive him. And amazing things are going to happen. Would you pray with me, please? Lord, it's easy for us at times to lose sight of your presence in our world. Thank you, Lord, for dwelling in our bodies. Thank you for the privilege of being your temple in this world.